much for coming on the What's Happening Black Blackbird's History to talk about your, your the latest book you've edited. It's Britain's Black Past, and it's it's based on a radio program. You're you're a, you're, you're a critically acclaimed, and it's a wonderful program. And I advise anyone who's not listened to it, Britain's Black Past. It's still available on BBC Four. Excellent program. So you took that 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 you took that program and literally turned it into a book and more. So I've, I've got to I've got to ask you, you know, how did how did you, how did you put the radio program together? Because you got so many different voices, and you've taken that same idea of different voices, and you brought it into a book form. So how did you go about that? Well, you know, I didn't go into the program thinking that it was going to become a book. Sometimes there's a film, and somebody writes a book afterward you know, about the film or does the history companion book or something like that. But this wasn't that. Um, we had done so many wonderful interviews uh, traveling all over Britain to get these stories out that afterwards I just thought, you know, there's so much more out there. We scholars, because I'm an academic, I'm a professor, we don't always know what people are doing and what they're reading and we don't know what they're doing they're on the part of the world to bring some of this knowledge to, to light. So it just seems so important to bring everyone together and then add some other voices and say, couldn't this be a book where everybody contributes the kind of wonderful finds they've had, the kind of deep research they've done and um, put it into a book form so people who didn't perhaps hear the series because it was 10 parts um, could have, have the book and use it. Hopefully people will look at it and think about, oh, can I use this in the school curriculum? Can I think about how I didn't even know these people existed even in my part of the world? Um, so it was it was a, a backward kind of way to do it, but I, I could have done it the other way, but I wouldn't have known about all the people who were doing all this, this wonderful work like yourself. Was that a conscious from the very start is that I'm gonna bring all this diverse range of we're going to have some academics, some community historians, actors, yeah. curators, this, yeah. this wide range of voices. Was that something at the heart of your uh, of, of the radio program or now in the book? Yeah, but I have to give great credit to the producers because they approached me about doing this radio series. And I said, well, fine. You know, I knew names that we all know and we interviewed some of them. But radio people are really incredible. Radio, television, film, they can do research that we academics can be too narrow to do. So they were finding all these people who've done some of this work. And, you know, there was the actor Patterson Joseph who came on board later and because we asked him to voice some of the letters in the book. And of course, that was right up his street. And we had people doing music and we had people who, a museum curator, um, people who were doing family histories and genealogies and researching that. And it was just too rich to keep it in the academic realm. It's an academic publisher, but the, the stories are very readable for the most part. They are all stories that even some of them reevaluating characters we might have known about, but also finding people that enrich what we might think about what the past really looked like. Gretchen, you were talking about the quality of the radio, re the research on radio. They found voices and views that you'd not considered or you'd not seen before. Mm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I've I myself had some experience with that in my own John Blank project, where they found ways into John Blank, ideas and people and resources. But I hadn't think. Do you think there's a, an untapped resource there in radio researchers? Radio, television. In fact, one of the people who did the piece in the book about family history was actually a BBC researcher for many years, Kathleen Chater, and she's done wonderful archival work. Um, you know, we, we, there's a certain arrogance about being in academia, and we think we can know it all and that we have good research skills, which we do. And some of the people in the book and on the program were in fact people I knew. And I made suggestions about people we could interview for that. And that was terrific. But then 
they found other people that I wouldn't have known. I don't know how they do it, frankly. I mean, I, I sit in archives, I sit in libraries, you sit in museums, um, but we don't necessarily know that there's somebody, for instance, up in Scotland who are doing a whole series of researches to, as a team on runaway slaves in Scotland and the adverts that were put out about, you know, how to recover slaves and who ran off. I wouldn't have known how to do that. I wouldn't have known about that. The radio people actually did a terrific job of bringing people in that I never would have thought of. Could you say a few words about the, the kind of the flow in terms of the narrative, the, the structure you had, the idea in the, as you put the book together, what, what you were looking for in terms of what, what you wanted people to get out of the book as, 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 they, as, as they look through it? Or you meant to pop in and out or you meant to read it from end to end? Either way. <laughs> Either way will work. My thought originally was to divide it into periods, um, but we're really talking about the 18th and early 19th centuries. So periods are built, already baked into that. But what about people who want to talk about um, musicians like, as you do, or actors? That We have a chapter on Ira Aldrich with new materials. We all think we know these people, but there are new things being discovered by Teresa Saxon. Um, Reevaluation. So I, I actually don't think that one needs to read it from cover to cover. It's very enriching and very exciting to do that, but it's available in all its parts to be seen as, as separate parts. So the hard part was to figure out how to, to structure all of these. The last chapter is the one on genealogy and family history. Um, but right before that, we have Kath, uh, Caroline Bressy talking about Victorian, um, Victorians and early Victorians and how they were thinking about theater and production um, with black characters. So when you talk about new ways in and reevaluations, I like that you re some people argue that's rewriting history when you review it. <laughs> You know, we're going through this thing now with the National Trust. People are looking at, we're looking at some of our National Trust houses here and they're finding shock horror. If there's some relationship to slavery and some people are troubled by that. How important do you think it is that we should, that we should re-interrogate, we should always be reviewing these characters that, that we have in our history, all of the Mary Princes, the Ira Aldridge. Is it important that we should always re-examine their lives? Well, you know, I think history, even though it's in the past, it's We, 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 it's important to find out what rules we have been overlooking, sometimes willfully, sometimes because we don't have access to knowing who actually lived in those houses. One of the, one of the great examples were two parallel chapters in a book about the same house in Bristol in which two black people, enslaved people lived. One became, was freed and one um, stayed enslaved. One was parallel, um, so the bridge that got named for him. And the other was a woman who stayed there for much of her life, but she was able to go back and forth between England and um, her original home in the West Indies. So I think we want to say, oh, this is a home that's open to the public. It's a museum. Um, people can come through and see what it looked like to have a Georgian house in Bristol by somebody who was very successful. But it adds another dimension to know that that house contained people who did a lot of the work who were in fact central to the functioning of the home. And doesn't that tell us something new about what life was like at that time? No, I, I, I guess you're right. We, we have new ways in, new ways of looking yeah. at these things. And that, that, that's where, uh, something I'm very passionate about, having the creative imagination to interrogate the text and think, well, what if, and go on intellectual journeys to, to, to your own curiosity. And that, I mean, um, books like this really help, or chapters really help you know, bring up, for instance, you talk about um, Ira Aldridge as an actor, but he was also an abolitionist and he spoke about, he spoke out about it and his relationship with, with the abolitionists. Really intriguing new ways of looking at um, Ira. I thought, I thought it was fascinating. Now, I know, I know I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here, but what are your personal highlights in the book? Oh, personal highlights. Oh, I don't know. Well, of course, I like my chapter, <laughs> and, uh, which is a, a reevaluation of Dido Elizabeth Bell, um, the subject of that film a few years ago, Bell. 
and using the research of other people who helped me do research on that, whose research I, I leaned on heavily. Did we evaluate that? Yeah, that film, of course, was criticized by some as not being faithful to the period. You know, how important do you think that is when we're telling these narratives, that we're telling these stories? Well, I'm not sure it was unfaithful to the period, but th there was certainly a lot of creative license <laughs> taken, um, you know, about who she married, which wasn't the kind of person she actually married, you know, and the amount of money she inherited, um, which was exaggerated in the film. Um, but it does give you a flavor of what it might have been like to live, to be a mixed race woman growing up and living in a particular household. I guess you know, the, the bell, the film is aimed at a general audience, the, kind of the man or woman in the street. It's, it's almost entertaining with a bit of, with some history associated with it. But this is clearly a history book. Hmm. So who, 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 who's, your, who's your target audience? Give it something, who are you writing the book for? Who are you putting it together for? I want everyone to read this book. I want everyone to know about this history and these people. I want anyone who is thinking that there is a, a particular story. You know that, I don't know if you know that TED talk by Adichie, um, Chimamanda Adichie. Uh, about stories. Does, about yeah, the 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 problem of a, a single story, yeah, yeah. and for so long there has been a single story, and uh, that's what I wanted to counter because there is such a rich, interesting, exciting story, and I tell this this story a lot, but I'm going to tell it again. Um, when I first was interested in and in working on this, it wasn't that I had a plan to write a book about this. I was actually thinking about writing a book about black people who were featured as characters in 18th century novels. And I did a lot of research on that. And when I was living in London, I went into a major bookshop because Peter Fryer's wonderful book, Staying Power, um, which is the sort of Bible about black British history. Still is, what, still is after, well, yeah. after almost 30 years. Over, it's 30 a fabulous, years. fabulous book. So I went into this bookshop because it had just been reissued in paperback. And I thought, oh, great, I will go buy this book and went in, couldn't find it anywhere, went up to um, the desk and asked the clerk, um, where can I find this book? I know it's just been published again, republished. And she, without even looking for the book or looking it up to say what section it was in, she said, Madam, there were no black people in Britain before 1945. And I said, well, yes, there were. And she said, oh, but in no numbers. And she never helped me find the book. I actually left and found it somewhere else. But that made me so angry that I thought, even when this wonderful work has been done, there, even when these books are published and available, there are people who are like standing guard over having this information be available. So when I wrote my book, Black England, um, I knew very well that I was not the first one to be writing about this. I really wanted a wider audience for it, and I wanted to kind of bring it together in a, in a more accessible way. So I think the book is aimed at anyone who thought, like as she did, that there were no black people in Britain before 1945. You seem to have written extensively on black British history. Now, with respect, haven't you got enough of your own history to write about? You know? Oh, I write about that too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I write about much more than people think. Um, my first book, was about Dora Carrington. It was a biography of a member of the Bloomsbury Group who lived with Lytton Strachey. That was my first book. But but, but, she, but she was yeah, the roots of that. With the most of the Bloomsbury Group was British, and she went it to was. America. Yep. So I was a you know I did my PhD in British literature. So that was my inroad. But then um, several years ago, I I did a book called Mr. and Mrs. Prince, and it was about two enslaved formerly enslaved people who lived in Vermont and Massachusetts. And they were, um, they managed to free themselves. They managed to get property. He managed to vote. And she became, she was a poet. She was known, um, Lucy Terry, as being a poet, even before um, Phyllis Wheatley. So I, I am very much engaged in that. In fact, I I do tell this other story, which was when I was two years into that research for that book, I made the astonishing discovery that her husband had been owned by my white 
ancestral family, that they were the, you know, it wasn't the direct, it was the sister or the brother of, and, but they knew him, they would have seen them. And because I'm a woman of color, people always assumed that I was saying, oh, I'm descended from these people who had been enslaved. <laughs> and I was saying, no, the shock was that I was descended from the enslavers. And that um, to me was a really important thing. So I give a lot of talks over here. It's, it's very odd to write about different kinds of people in different places and what people think you're known for. <laughs> is there a, a, a commonality between Black American history and British history? Are they the same? Are they different? What, 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 what things do, do they have in common, if any? In well, pandemic? first of all, America had extensive slavery on its own soil. I mean, that's the big, big difference. British plantations were not in Britain, um, but they were here. I think for me, the thing that really drives me, whether I'm writing about a white person or a black person or what history I'm looking at, is to try to let people know that there's a story that you don't recognize. So for instance, when I did the Prince book, I would go on radio and people would say, aha, the North was as bad as the South because these people were enslaved in the North. And um, so it's okay, you can't be mad at us for having plantations and, and you know cotton fields and all of that. And I would say, but the important thing to know is that there was this history in the north that black people were enslaved often in rural communities and we don't know that so my mission has always been to let people know their own history to let people realize that there was more behind this than than you thought there might be so all those people who thought there were no black people enslaved in northern america or in new england they aren't that different to me from those people in England, who think there were no black people there early on. Um, but, but, uh, to say there's no slaves in England, England is not quite true. My own hometown, Liverpool, there's notices well, no, well, no, but, 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 where they were selling slaves. They yeah. were published. You know, there, there was slavery. Maybe you weren't wearing, working on cotton fields, such as they were in America. But slavery was here in Britain, even though Absolutely. it was totally illegal. And, and you know, you couldn't, couldn't be a slave here. And there's many, there right. many cases, just to say the opposite, the reality is. So it's what, absolutely what, true. We're not absolutely talking about the true. similarities. The, the case we talk about is the was always held up is the um the Rosa uh, um, Rosa Parks and the Birmingham the bus strike, and we have, a, we have the same thing in Bristol, the Bristol bus strike. The, 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 it's very, very, it's like in, it's in a, the, the background is different, but the ambition is the same to be recognised because we have some discrimination because you're black. Aren't those the things that they have in common in terms of the, the, the civil rights or the, the movement in America is very similar to what's had here in Britain, the, the, the search for rights. Do you, do you think those things are, are common? They have a, a, a common understanding. I think that when, especially in the 70s in Britain, when people became very active and aware um, in, in Britain, they were drawing a great deal on American activism and those people. So in, in 100 or 200 years earlier, people like Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells had spent a great deal of time in Britain traveling and explaining their abolitionist moves. But in the 70s and 80s, we suddenly, we, they were looking in Britain at people like Angela Davis and Malcolm X and the civil rights movement in America as models. So I think that the, the newer thing has been to say, okay, they were great models, but there are, we have some of our own and we should not put them aside in favor of those who have a higher profile. So people like David um, Olasoga and others who are bringing this back to life and talking about this uh, are really crucial because it's easy to say, you know, oh, that happened over there. Um, but in fact, you, as a someone from Liverpool, have a long and, and rich history. And I will mention there is a good chapter about the history of Liverpool in the book, by yeah, the way. Ray Costello, a friend of mine, has written a, a, a good chapter indeed. You talk talking of uh, David Osoga. David Osoga is, is, is British, is black, and he writes about black Britain. You know, some people are perplexed. Colin Grant's just done a, radio, a, a series of talks, essays on Radio 3. Um, one of them was about, he talks about uh, Stephen Fryer, not Stephen, but Peter, Peter Fryer and his book, a white man writing the seminal text on black British history. Is this right? How can this be? Can a black, per can a white person write about black history? 
And be, well, he, he did, he, didn't he? <laughs> well, oh, he did. Yeah, oh, <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the sense of the fact that you, to your, you made the point earlier that it's a seminal text. It's still with us today after it was over 30 years. Is, is that, do you have a, is it right that white people can write about black history? You know, I, I find this a very frustrating question <laughs> because we would not know half of what we know if Peter Fryer hadn't spent those decades plowing through the archives and finding this information. No black historian is faulting him for having found the work that they have found so useful to their own work. Everyone sings his praises and the praises of this book. I, I like to turn the question around and say, I have written, I'm now signed a contract for my fourth book on, on black British history. Um, but I've also written a biography of Frances Hodgson Burnett who wrote The Secret Garden. No one said to me, you're a woman of why are you writing about her? Nobody has said that to me about that as well. Um, why is it not possible that people who are good historians, good researchers, can, can write these same kinds of books because they benefit everyone? And the other example I give is David Blight, who just won last year won the Pulitzer Prize yeah. for his magisterial biography of of Frederick Douglass. Nobody said, oh, this is a wonderful book, but you shouldn't have mm. done it. Mm. No, 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 exactly. It's a fantastic book, really huge. Uh, the scholarship, and it's, and it's yeah. big, and it's also readable. Like, <laughs> it's very, very readable. Very readable indeed. So I, I take it, you, 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 you don't see any difference. It's history, who writes it? It's not the issue. It's the quality of that writing that matters. It's the quality of the work and the, and the, the honesty. I mean, people should be honest about what they can or cannot know. I did not ever live in Victorian London. Nobody writing about Victorian London now lived in Victorian London. But if you can take an honest evaluation and research to bring that to life, I actually don't care who's doing it, if it's useful and helpful. At the same time, at the same time, I think it's really important that we promote, value, and encourage the work of Black historians who have, in many cases, done work that's really crucial to our understanding and make sure they get credit, make sure that their work is promoted, and they're not just sitting in some library without some sense that this affects everybody. Oh, oh, th well, thank you so much for that, uh, Gretchen. And I, I, I want to leave the last word to you in terms of uh, this, the Britain's Black Past. You know, it started as a radio program. It's now a book. How do you see it going forward? How do you see I it would, for the, yeah. next steps, the next steps? <laughs> well, the book's done. It's out there. It's available. The pandemic hasn't helped because I think it was hard to get it into the Amazon um, warehouses. And so that was held it back a bit. My hope is that, first of all, this is this is encouraging more people who've done work like this to bring to to make the cast the net widely bring in actors bring in um people who do art history bring in all these other people and move it forward but also to pass it to move it forward so young people will know about their own histories and those are people who live among them well, thank you so much for that, Gretchen. Thank you so much for me. <laughs> oh, it was a great pleasure. It was nice talking to you, Michael. Okay. Goodbye now. <laughs>